Okay, I guess we will get started today. Uh, thanks to each of you for taking the time to phone in. My name is Leanne Hackman Carty, and uh, I've been running the EDA since uh, 2009. Now, Michelle Levisseur has been a member of ours for quite a while, and uh, Michelle approached us recently with this topic, and we said, sure, we will run a webinar on this topic. And so she's put this all together today. Why don't we just jump right in? Um, we'll chat uh, with everyone, of course, who is uh, uh, who is are our speakers. And Michelle, I know that you've got lots to say as well, but why don't we start Barry Morishita from AUMA. Um, you are co-hosting with us, and we thank you so much for your support. And uh, why don't you kick things off for us? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, welcome uh, to today's session. We're really pleased to co-host with, uh, with the EDA. And I want to really thank the EDA for um, taking the time to put these on. Uh, technology aside, I think they're really important topics. And uh, I know uh, getting to some of these things in a timely fashion are really important and they provide uh, the potential for great value for Alberta's economy and jobs. So thanks again, EDA. So uh, just a little bit about AUMA. So we represent uh, summer villages, villages, towns, uh, cities, and specialized municipalities in Alberta. And uh, we represent 85% of the population in the province in those municipalities. So uh, really happy that uh, we're partnering. And um, today's topic, which is self-help for municipalities amidst Alberta's oil field cleanup crisis, is certainly one that AUMA is very familiar with. Uh, we have a long history of advocacy regarding um, abandoned energy infrastructure and streamlining process for remediated brownfield sites. Uh, part of um, the work that AUMA did on West included a specific ask for the very uh, money in the budget that was uh, sent, uh, committed to by the federal government to work on the abandoned well sites. So, uh, AUMA has been very much a uh, part of that. Um, my city in the city of Brooks, the Southern Alberta is no stranger to brownfield sites. And certainly uh, I hear from a lot of my uh, friends and neighbors in the county who have abandoned wells on farmland and things where that has gotten to be an issue in our area as well. We have a lot of, a lot of gas wells uh, in, uh, in my area in Southern Alberta. So certainly this is a timely consideration. The other thing I want to just mention is that when I've done my summer tours, a lot of uh, the communities that I visited and went to um, have a lot of this reclamation that needs to be done. And uh, so I think this is a great, great topic. So I'm going to start by introducing uh, Michelle, who's uh, from the town of Kalmar. And uh, Michelle, it's great to see you. Um, she's the economic development officer. Um, and like many of her counterparts, she works tirelessly for that community to bring uh, economic opportunities and provide growth and sustainability there. Um, and Kalmar, not like, uh, unlike some of the Alberta municipalities we just talked about, um, has various parcels of land uh, that have been left undeveloped. And some of it usually is very prime if they're older communities in the province and, and they sit there empty and fenced typically uh, and uh, not really providing much value to the communities. So Michelle is um, going to start our webinar off today. So Michelle, without any further ado, uh, I turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Barry. And I just want to take a minute to thank Leanne and Nancy so much for your help to set this up. This has been um, something that I've been working on for about 18 months since I've been with Calmar. So if you're not sure where Kalmar is, we're um, a small rural community, just 15 minutes uh, west of the city of Leduc. We have about 2,300 people that live in town and about almost 100 small local businesses. Um, okay, so I'm going to back up. Um, so again, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Leanne. And thank you, Nancy, for setting up the webinar. Um, I wanted to just mention Kalmar is a small rural community just 15 minutes southwest of the city. Like and um, we have about 2,300 residents in our community, about 100 small local businesses. So I wanted to start my presentation off with showing um, this map, which represents Kalmar on the ESAR site. If you haven't looked at this site, um, with regards to your community, I highly recommend it because it does actually share a lot of great information. 
So this, this picture here, particularly, all the purple dots on here are representing where an environmental site assessment was completed or a reclamation certificate was distributed. Um, so as you can see in Kalmar, um, there's a lot of purple dots. So there's been a lot of well site activity and this dates way back to the 50s, 60s and so on. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Regan. Regan, oh, there we go. Okay, so this here um, is an image of a piece of land in Kalmar that has become my nemesis. Um, this piece of land is basically what has inspired my obsession with contaminated sites and has been um, my focus the last 18 months. It's about 130 acre parcel of property just on the east side of our community. It's zoned commercial and light industrial. You'll see here there's six well sites on the property. Three of these sites in the 11-30 box you can see are actually um, in a remediation process right now. But the other three sites, um, we don't have an understanding of what um, is happening at these sites. There's no known companies to hold accountable to clean up um, from past oil and gas activity. And these sites do not qualify um, for orphaned, the orphaned well um, support because they have old reclamation certificates. So that is something that's been a huge challenge for us. Eventually, this site went into um, property tax arrears because uh, we couldn't sell it, it couldn't be developed. Um, as you can see, the six sites have really put us in a bit of a predicament. The land is for sale. I get calls on this property weekly because it is prime highway commercial and prime industrial because it does have um, a rail line that backs onto the property. So we do get a ton of interest, but if we aren't able to develop this property, it could eventually be our demise. Um, so it is compromising the viability of my town and has been um, a real concern for us. So um, the challenge for me has been just accessing information specific to this piece of property. Um, you saw the ESAR information that I, I pointed out in originally. However, the information on ESAR is only what is posted by AEP or AER. So what I've learned through the last 18 months is that the information is not comprehensive. Um, some of it is confidential and you can request it, but there is a process. Um, the other challenge is that all of these sites have had reclamation certificates. However, in the num last number of years, 10 plus, the regulations have changed for reclamation and remediation. So those old reclamation certificates don't carry any weight in terms of getting this land developed. So there is a requirement to go through ESAs um, and find out again what we have to do to develop the property. Um, another challenge that I've had was just understanding who to talk to. So Regan, if you could go to the next slide. Um, this is a list of um, organizations that I have talked to in depth over the last 18 months, just looking for information on this parcel of land in particular. Um, it was kind of like a real crazy circle of like, no, we're not the right organization, talk to this person, no talk to this person, no talk to this person. So I kind of was spinning my wheels for a very, very, very long time. And it, it really did become um, a little bit of a frustration for me because it sort of turned into a pointing finger, finger scenario of who is actually responsible and who can help us from a municipal perspective to gather the appropriate facts and the appropriate information to help to get this property sold and ultimately developed. So um, this is where um, Regan and his group come in. Um, if you wanna just go to the next slide, Regan. So I came across Regan um, and a bunch of his colleagues, um, Mark Dorn, I noticed you're on the call, hi Mark, um, just by accident. And it was a very happy accident for me because Regan and his group with the Alberta Liability Disclosure Project is a wealth of knowledge. 
Um, meeting these guys has been a game changer for me and has ultimately changed my life with regards to learning about contaminated sites and helping me to move forward with the project to develop the land in Kalmar. Um, the collective knowledge that this book has and, and the information that they have been able to provide to me has been invaluable. So it was really important for me to coordinate this webinar to access Regan and his group and so they can share with the number of municipalities um, the information that they can provide to us as municipal leaders and with our private landowners within our communities. And ultimately at the end of the day, what I really wanna see is that we begin to collaborate as municipalities and private landowners to come together and share the information, share the supports and advocate for support to help us get these sites cleaned up and, um, and promote development in the community. So with that said, um, I do want to pass the, um, the mic over to Regan. Um, I'm happy to introduce him. He's uh, an independent public interest researcher who studies and has a passion for oil patch. This is not his full-time job. He, like me, um, I guess I've kind of become like him. We have a passion for this and it's become our obsession. So he does some great work. Um, I'm gonna just let him explain what he's been doing in the last number of months as well. And a little bit more about um, Dr. Stelfox, who's joining him and um, the Alberta Liabilities Disclosure Project. So off to you, Regan, thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, for uh, helping to set the stage and for your uh, very generous introduction. Um, I, I'll flip back to my presentation. So I'd like to say hi to everyone. I'm, it's an honor to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share some of my recent work and uh, some of you may already know me, but for those of you who don't, uh, I'm Regan Boychuk, the lead researcher with the Alberta Liabilities Disclosure Project. It's a nonpartisan volunteer run organization uh, that I co-founded about a year and a half ago uh, with a coalition of researchers, landowners, uh, economists, former regulators and industry veterans. I want to talk today about one of the biggest challenges facing our province today one that's especially urgent for municipalities like yourselves, the crisis of unfunded oil and gas liabilities here in Alberta. And I'd also like to talk about what kind of self-help strategies uh, municipalities and landowners uh, can take to address this crisis. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to walk through how we got to this place, uh, what the state of play is right now, and so we don't all leave too depressed. I'll close by talking about uh, what we can all do to stand up for yourselves and for your constituents. And we'll have a discussion about next steps and how we can work together in the coming months. Uh, we have a lot of local specific data available uh, and uh, we're hoping uh, <clears throat> it's of interest to all of you here today. I just like to start by um, putting this a little bit in context for myself. Um, it's personal. Um, I've born and raised here in, in Alberta. I grew up uh, around Grand Prairie. This is one of my grandparents' farms. Um, and on the other side, the other farm on my mom's side, um, my grandpa's farm has a bunch of uh, pipelines and wells on it um, that are paid annual compensation uh, that have helped put all the grandkids through post-secondary education, uh, which has been great. Um, but um, if this stuff doesn't get cleaned up, um, it's uh, a risk to being able to sell the farm um, having this stuff cleaned up and so <clears throat> it affects me personally as well as uh, everyone else that this touches in the province and just start by saying a little bit about the scale of the problem here in Alberta uh, we've drilled over 450,000 oil and gas wells in Alberta over the last decade one for every 10 people in the province most of them either need to be cleaned up now or they will be in the near future and they're everywhere from rural areas to reserves and cities <clears throat> and every one of them is a potential health risk an economic liability as it ages they all break down uh, there's no way to avoid that and there's more than 1500 oil and gas wells within urban municipal within urban areas in alberta and we know that it, at least 10 percent of them leak uh, <clears throat> as the alberta energy regulators former chief environmental scientist said that the regulator doesn't have the expertise to deal with the growing public health and safety issues uh, in a timely manner when it comes to these issues. Um, one of our 
close members, uh, Mark Doran, his, his mother, Sharon, uh, Shirley Doran in Didsbury exemplifies that. After an oil well near her garden illegally vented natural gas for many years, she's been diagnosed with petroleum-induced Parkinson's disease. And her family has spent many, many years uh, winding their way through the regulatory system and the legal system, uh, trying to get that, still getting that well properly cleaned up. We can speak a little bit more specifically about Leduc County, where, where Calmar's found. Um, there's more than 3,000 wells in, in the county of Leduc. And we all know uh, Leduc number one is kind of being the birthplace of the modern industry in Alberta. And so there's a lot of some of the, the oldest wells uh, are in this area are a, a particular challenge. And so there's, there's two important questions when we, when we look at um, each of our neighborhoods and we see how much oil and gas infrastructure has accumulated. <clears throat> and those, those two questions are that you need to know is how much is it going to cost to clean this stuff up and who's going to pay for it? Uh, th those are things that should may not have been at top of mind um, for a long time, but I, I think those two questions deserve a lot of attention uh, these days. So let's start with the second one. Uh, who's going to pay? The answer is uh, clear as mud. Um, at least in principle, it's perfectly clear. The polluter pays principle. It's reflected in provincial law and federal law. It's endorsed by industry, by the government. Uh, they all pay at least lip service to it, and it's very clear that the company that benefited from the development uh, should be responsible for returning it to near its original site. Uh, but in practice, uh, we have nothing of the sort. Uh, we don't have the rules in force uh, to make sure that that happens. And um, after a century of development, um, that's grown into a fairly considerable problem. The regulators have always known what to do, uh, but it was never very complicated how to fix this. Um, but the problem has been the political will to stand up to industry, to make it do what it may not uh, otherwise want to do. And so I want to give some examples about how we got into this. Um, in 1991, the court said that you have to clean up everything. This is the first time the oil and gas industry um, had to put this cleanup liabilities on their balance sheet. Up in, for the first 75 years in Alberta, it had never been much of a concern for industry. Uh, but it, that changed in 1991. And we had to start accounting for cleanup and accounting rules changed. Uh, and the court said, you have to clean up even if you go bankrupt. That's no escape. That the cleanup comes before lenders. Um, and this created a dilemma for industry. And it led to dramatic changes. Because you had to clean up, um, it became impossible to borrow money in Alberta uh, without promising that you would clean up your mess, without signing personal guarantees. Uh, if the banks caught any whiff of any troubles or spills or leaks, they would send out soil scientists to investigate. Uh, and the banks did the job of enforcing um, the cleanup. And for 18 months, everything in Alberta changed. After 75 years of drilling, there was a dramatic shift in Alberta. The, every, the entire focus changed to cleaning up. These old fields like Leduc, um, they were going to be cleaned up now. Um, but that only lasted for 18 months in Alberta. As soon as Ralph Klein became the environment minister uh, and then was elected in December 1992, this era of cleaning up what they'd accumulated for 75 years uh, came to an end. And there's been a number of efforts throughout the years to, to try to address these, clean up these old wells, um, but industry pressure has brought them to an end. And so rather than from 1991 leading to the change where we gradually cleaned up everything we'd accumulated, uh, we still haven't addressed the issue 30 years later. Uh, since 1991, we've drilled another quarter million wells. We've added to the list of what eventually needs to be cleaned up. And because we've collected so little, um, <clears throat> we've accumulated a very serious problem that's so big it's creating it's creating quite a dilemma for regulators and the government about how to deal um, <clears throat> with this issue. <clears throat> the Redwater case is uh, many of you might be familiar with. It was an uh, Okotoks-based company that had a stake in just 17 producing wells, uh, but had almost 100 inactive wells. And uh, in 2005, it went bankrupt. At the time of its insolvency, it owed ATB Financial, its bank, about $5 million. Uh, but what industry tried to do in this case is 
the bankruptcy trustee wanted to sell all the valuable wells and leave all the inactive wells for someone else to deal with. They just wanted to take the good stuff, pay themselves back and leave the rest for someone else to worry about, like the Orphan Well Association. And the lower court decisions in 2016 ruled that uh, the company's obligation to pay creditors takes precedence over cleanup. And that meant industries could pay back creditors before having to clean anything up. Uh, in practical terms, that means that energy companies could walk away from old oil and gas wells, leaving them to be someone else's responsibility. This is a major threat to the polluter pays principle. Thankfully, in 2019, the Supreme Court overturned uh, the Alberta court decisions and reaffirmed the polluter pays principle. In their decision, they stated that the energy companies must fulfill their environmental obligations before paying back creditors in case of insolvency or bankruptcy. But the damage had already been done. Creditors cleared much of the dead weight and the number of orphan wells in Alberta has grown significantly in recent years, uh, as well as the loophole where uh, all of these orphans have failed to be properly funded like the, old, like the, the law intends. And so this is the context for the aid uh, that has recently uh, arrived for Alberta. Um, as the federal government was preparing a bailout for Alberta's struggling oil and gas industry earlier this year, we publicly called on them to use the, that leverage to get reform around these issues in Alberta. For example, we recommended they require the Orphan Well Association to do what it should already be doing, but has consistently failed to do, and that's collect enough fees from industry annually uh, to cover the cost of the full inventory of all of its orphaned oil field infrastructure. If Alberta followed the existing law and used credible cleanup estimates, for example, this could have, this could have resulted in more than a billion dollars being collected through the orphan levy this year alone. And that's another billion dollars we could have to put Albertans back to work cleaning up these old wells. Unfortunately, uh, the terms haven't been made public yet between the federal government and the province for the billion dollars they're transferring to deal with um, inactive wells, of which there are about 95,000 in Alberta. And uh, just a week later, uh, the province announced how it's going to spend that billion dollars through the site rehabilitation program. Uh, and unfortunately, the provincial government is going to be giving out this federal money as a grant, as subsidies. Uh, they're not going to use it to leverage industry spending by lending it out. Uh, and so that means <clears throat> taxpayers are going to be paying for this cleanup. And so while a billion dollars is welcome, it's going to clean up some wells and put folks back to work. Um, it's a small step uh, in this long journey of cleanup and it's in the wrong direction because it isn't the polluter that's paying for it. It's the taxpayers. And so that's been a concern. And that's what it comes down to. Um, we've seen when the polluter doesn't pay, um, there's, $173 million in unpaid municipal taxes over the last years, uh, two years. And from what I understand, uh, the problem continues to accelerate. Every time those municipalities have to cut programs or services or raise taxes because um, you're all effectively subsidizing the industry for these unpaid municipal taxes and paying their cleanup costs, um, which it should be them responsible for. So in some, if industry doesn't pay for the cleanup, us taxpayers, are all going to have to. Uh, and so that brings us back to the other question of the price tag of what this is all going to add up to. Uh, and so uh, the good news there is that ALDP has together with our partners at ALSIS, uh, landscape ecologists and environmental consultants, um, we've brought together our work uh, into the incredibly powerful ALSIS tool that Dr. Brad Stell Fox has been developing over uh, many years. And so I'd like to hand over the mic, uh, so to speak, to Brad uh, to tell you a little bit about ALSIS and the capabilities we have uh, for sharing, for helping uh, folks on the call here today. So if anyone nods, can you see a, um, a PowerPoint with a blue bit background? Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much for the opportunity to attend. It's, it's been a pleasure working with Regan and his colleagues. Um, what the LCS group is doing is essentially providing online technology, geospatial technology, um, to help uh, Albertans and specifically municipalities understand uh, land use in general, but specifically the dynamics around uh, well sites and well site reclamation. Um, so what we have is an online tool called ELSIs that for each municipality at very high resolution is tracking all land uses 
in the municipality. So we're talking about forestry and energy, agriculture, transportation, residential, uh, tourism, and others. And the, the topic today is, is generically the energy sector and more specifically wells and, uh, and reclamation dynamics. So in addition to looking at all the land uses, it's also tracking um, all the natural processes of, of the environment, climate and climate change and wildlife habitat, wildlife populations, et cetera. And as Michelle mentioned, um, you can't look at the energy sector in isolation. It's when it starts interacting with all the other elements. So for example, if you have a residential population and you have a town or city and you want it to grow, <clears throat> you can very quickly find yourself um, being constrained by the legacy of these wells and, uh, and their adverse effects. So what we've essentially done for every essentially meter, square meter of the province of Alberta is assembled information on the human population, uh, the number, its age, its housing, its income, its ethnicity from, um, from uh, every five year censuses. We've assembled information on commodity production of all of the key primary commodities that are produced um, by every municipality, the natural capital, so water quality and plant communities, air quality, groundwater, water supply, conductivity, and then the economics, you know, classic jobs, royalties, rents, supply chain. And then core to it is the physical properties of these municipalities. So the rainfall, elevation, slope, minerals, soils, temperature, and climate change. So what we can do then is bring each of these things together um, and help people understand that what municipalities are dealing with is a system. And all of these different land uses are all creating benefits without exception. They're all creating liabilities without exception. That's what Regan was talking about. And it's only by bringing these key processes together in space and time, can you see these municipalities for the systems they are. So as Regan mentioned, um, through his hard work and that of the overall team, we're able to bring together the most current database that's looking at the entire hydrocarbon sector and particularly the wells. So we have an abundance of information and I'm not going to go through these but these are all of the various variables relating to every single well in Alberta. Where are they? When were they produced? What kind of well are they? Are they a gas well or oil well or an in situ well or water injection well? What is their history in terms of production? What did it cost to build? Excuse me, I think I just jumped out of presentation mode, jump back. Um, how deep are they, et cetera, et cetera. So all that information we've been able to bring into ELSI's so that we can build maps and dynamics. And here we're getting, we're looking at um, essentially all the gas wells. How did they arrive in Alberta? So we can simulate those through time. What is their distribution? How many jobs, royalties and rents have they created? What is their effect on soil carbon or water quality or wildlife habitat? Or how often do they interfere with say expansion of towns like Michelle was talking about? So very quickly, this is an example of a gas well. Here's the history of oil wells. Here's the history of bitumen wells in situ and surface mining. Um, the abandoned wells, and you can see how many we have. And here we're looking at their reclamation costs, in this case, um, a low estimate of $16 billion, um, suspension wells, and if you put all the wells together. So we know where they are, we know when they were produced, um, we know the details of each and every well, thanks to the hard work that Regan and colleagues have done. Um, so all of that information also exists in, in Excel spreadsheets, so I can very quickly um, summarize all that information for any specific municipality as an Excel spreadsheet showing a a variety of metrics that are key to understanding the magnitude of this challenge. Um, but I'm not going to go into that in any detail, just to, but it's, it's important to know that we can very quickly, instantaneously summarize thousands of variables for every municipality. So if you have this information for every well, um, you can then estimate well reclamation costs and as Regan has pioneered an approach that looks at the best available data um, and there's no certainty on any one estimate. So what we do is adopt sensitivity analysis to create low, medium and high estimates. And then um, we can apply econometric coefficients um, that come to us by people like Mark and Nielski um, that can translate these reclamation liabilities into the benefits of create in terms of GDP or jobs or employment. And that allows us to map these through time and allow clients like municipalities to explore what I'd call what if scenarios. So if we are gonna reclaim these, um, what are the 
what are the ways in which we do it? And my concern right now, and I share it with Regan, is that it's a very ad hoc approach, which it's almost first come, first serve. So whoever can gain access to the money, um, they may receive some financial um, subsidies and away they go. But in, in reality, there should be some thought, some logic. Should it be oldest first? Should we move from most to least expensive? Should we be um, reclaiming wells based on their effects on healthcare uh, metrics? Um, should we be focusing on landowner compensation? Should we be looking at ranking them by liability to agriculture or using Michelle's example again, those that are interfering with urban expansion? Um, we can rank them by environmental liability in terms of their effects on air, land, water, and wildlife. We can rank them by companies, rank them by municipalities, um, or their effects on GDP, employment, and jobs. So, for example, here's a, here we have a certain amount of liability. Um, we're looking at about $55 billion of liability. We can say the amount of money coming in is constant every year. So we have a basically a linear reclamation. Or we could say the money is going to start slow increase and then slow down, in which case we'd see a sigmoid curve like this, and we can reclaim those wells by whatever criteria that stakeholders and municipalities think are important. Um, and then zooming into, say, um, Ladue County, and which Michelle was talking about in, in the dynamics around Kalmar, um, we can look at where these liabilities are and reclaim them by whatever criteria that uh, municipalities think are most important or to explore a variety of those. Um, that allows us to take this information and put them into uh, a template, this one called Spatial and Temporal Dynamics of Oil and Gas Wells in Leduc County, and then help people understand how many wells there are. This is just a screen capture of, I don't know, a uh, report that's got about 30 pages or 40 pages. Um, showing where the wells are, their antiquity, their ownership, their status, um, how close they are to, to water, how they're affecting carbon, how they're interfering with, say, rural residential development, and then allow people to explore them differently. Um, so that's a very, very quick overview of uh, what's an immense amount of data operating very nicely on a, uh, on a web-delivered platform intended to help uh, municipalities or other stakeholders understand the magnitude of the liability and how we can bring some logic to how they're reclaimed and what the costs are. So uh, sorry for rambling on for probably too many minutes, but maybe give people a quick overview of some of the technology the LCS group has built, um, you know, kind of catalyzed by uh, just a great uh, collaboration with Regan and Mark and others. So uh, I'll pass it back to you folks now. Thank you very much, Brad. And if uh, hopefully we're back to seeing my screen. Yep. Go. See yours. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll just say a bit about how ALDP came up with all of this data. And uh, three years ago, the Alberta Energy Regulator uh, commissioned a, a detailed internal analysis to, to reassess how much it's going to cost to clean up these old wells in Alberta. And they work closely with industry. Um, they developed uh, more than 100 different scenarios for different types of wells, different ages of wells, and different regions to uh, commission hundreds and hundreds of very detailed estimates um, from private sector service companies. Um, but what they found when they did this work uh, was that the numbers were enormous uh, and the project was abandoned. Um, their initial work, they did a lot of impressive analysis. Uh, when they got the first kind of rough uh, bottom line numbers, they showed that their private estimates were five to ten times larger than their public estimates, and the project was shelved. Uh, all work was stopped on completing this work. Um, but by chance, I got this information through a freedom of information request. And so I got all of the data and methodology that the regulator and its subject matter experts had put into this work. And uh, just through my other work and connections to folks in the industry, I had the, the other pieces to finish the job that the regulator had started. And so that's uh, what ALDP did last year was finish the work they started. Um, we sorted Alberta's 300,000 um, oil and gas wells into 368 different cost categories um, based on a variety of factors that were um, established by the regulator itself. Um, and we have over a million estimates um, for every well site in Alberta. Now we have the, the regulator's public estimate and then we have two private sector estimates. 
and then we've worked with ALSIS closely to map all that and to use the power of the ALSIS system to slice and dice this any way you can imagine and uh, <clears throat> kind of extract that um, the insight that's available from this. And what we found um, just on the well side, that's one component of the overall cleanup, but um, we have very detailed data about the oil and gas wells themselves. Um, and what ALDP found was the cost of cleaning up those wells is ranges between 40 and $70 billion um, for which the industry doesn't have any money in the bank. There isn't uh, any sort of savings program. The industry hasn't set aside any money uh, for this. And so this is the scale of the challenge. This is uh, two to three and a half times larger than what the regulator says publicly it's going to cost. But using their own internal data and methodology, um, ALDP shows that it's, it's significantly larger. And uh, that's, the, that's the scale of the, the, the problem that we're facing. And so in terms of Leduc County, um, to, to make it a little bit more specific, what it looks like in each county, part of what we've done with um, Alsis and Brad is to um, map all of these wells by political jurisdiction, by county, um, by, and so we can tell each local politician, MLA, MP, um, what the situation looks like in their neighborhood. And uh, so in Leduc, um, <clears throat> there's about 3,000 wells um, of, of varying ages. And the first thing to note is um, most of those wells are, are, are oil, uh, which is more expensive to clean up, more complicated. The remediation can be more expensive um, when it comes to oil versus gas. Um, and the age of these wells is, is a major factor. Um, the older uh, the wells means the lower standards they were drilled under. And so those are where we're gonna encounter the highest costs. Uh, <clears throat> I actually worked on service rigs out of Brooks uh, when I was going to university working on the shallow gas wells. Hi Regan, sorry to interrupt you. Can you full screen your, your presentation? Sorry. There we go. Thank you. And so a lot of the wells in Leduc are, uh, of, <clears throat> are older. And so uh, for all the wells in all of Alberta, there's only $227 million uh, in deposits held for the cleanup. And when we look uh, just, for the, just for the county of Leduc, uh, we look at the range of just cleaning up the wells. Um, we're looking at a range of between five and 800, uh, or half a billion dollars and over a billion dollars. Uh, so that gives you an, I, uh, an idea of just how inadequate uh, the security held by the regulator is. Well, just, to, just in Leduc, if we take the average estimate to clean up the wells, uh, we're many multiples of what's held by, uh, on behalf of the entire industry. Uh, that $227 million is what's held for every well in Alberta. Uh, and, well, <clears throat> the challenge just in Leduc dwarfs that, um, even if we got to spend the entire amount just in one county. And so... Um, I understand this can be overwhelming. Um, it's a, I'm not going to lie. It's a, <clears throat> this is a, another major challenge that people may not have been aware of. Um, and there's a tendency to maybe want to give up. Uh, but it's too big of it. We'll never get them to pay. Uh, but here in Leduc County, where it all started, we know uh, better than most uh, what the consequences are of, of an, ignoring this problem and watching it continuing to get worse. Uh, and so this is about the dollar amount, but there's, there's other risks involved in the cleanup and this oil and gas infrastructure all poses a threat eventually. It's just concrete and steel. It's breaking down and every well will eventually leak. It's going to take constant vigilance to keep an eye, to maintain and to prevent any further risks from this infrastructure, um, whether even if it does get cleaned up. And so there's health risks um, when it comes to leaking wells, uh, land that can't be farmed or developed because of aging well sites and the job and also the jobs that could have been created in Leduc County for cleanup. Our estimate is $300 million in employment income would come from cleaning up those 3,000 wells and f would also create 4,000 jobs and close to $800 million in economic activity uh, just to clean up the wells in that one county. Uh, and so, uh, and that's just the cleanup. There's many other benefits once that's done, as land, more land becomes available for farming, housing, and other productive uses. And so this is just the tip of the iceberg of what ALDP um, has to offer um, when it comes to insight and data to help with municipal pol policymakers and administrators. Um, with the maps and charts, we can show the evolution of the oil and gas industry. Um, 
and model different scenarios of different uh, cleanup approaches and to show what we're missing out on by not tackling um, what could be a reclamation boom. And uh, <clears throat> so we're in difficult, difficult times when it comes to the industry, um, industry that is struggling to pay landowners for operating on their land, struggling to pay their municipal taxes, and um, perhaps a government that's not entirely sympathetic to the plight of municipalities and those challenges. And so a big part of what ALDP wants to do is to help <clears throat> offer strategies of what can be done that doesn't involve asking for a favor from a politician, what, what avenues exist to start making progress on these issues. And uh, one of the most important things and one of the projects that my main collaborator, Mark Doran, has been a big advocate of is to connect with other municipalities. Um, these, are, these are complex and overwhelming issues uh, and we shouldn't be leaving folks like Michelle alone to figure it all out by herself. Uh, we should be collaborating to the greatest extent possible to pursue similar issues together, to pool our resources and capacity um, to challenge these. And there, there are a number of groups where landowners um, collaborate on these issues with oil and gas and it would be wonderful to see the municipalities uh, do more of that and to collaborate and collect take collective action um, to try to uh, raise a lot of these issues um, with offic other officials. Another one of the important things and where a lot of the solutions lie is with landowners. Uh, landowners have rights that need to be balanced with the industry and to give one example of one of the dilemmas municipalities are facing when it comes to unpaid taxes is you have very few options when it comes to collecting on those. Uh, but by, collecting, by connecting with landowners, um, almost every lease in Alberta includes the clause that says if you haven't paid your taxes, um, the lease can be terminated. And so while municipal officials may have few options, uh, if they connect with the, the landowner, uh, they could help put the ball back in the court of industry by having that lease terminated, essentially put a lock on the enforced industry to go back to the service rights board to negotiate uh, getting back on the site. And it's uh, one of the ways um, that municipalities can help push back against the growing problem of, of uh, tax delinquents. Uh, another one in that those unpaid taxes are a major challenge um, and what's coming is property tax decreases that are going to be forced on municipalities from the provincial government. Um, they were scheduled to come into place this year, uh, but they've been delayed, uh, but they're still coming. And so we've got a, a reprieve of lowering the rates, um, but there are ways that municipalities could compensate for what they should be expecting is a, a further decrease in, in property tax once the, the rates are lowered. Um, but Understanding safe and healthy regulations and the proper sizing of oil and gas sites. Uh, some of the issues that are in municipal jurisdiction offer opportunities for increasing tax revenue from other sources to help compensate for uh, the major challenges in property taxes and these coming rate decreases. And so those are the sort of solutions we've been uh, exploring and could um, offer some more advice on. Um, and some of those sort of options about properly sizing oil and gas sites, uh, almost all of them are too small uh, from a health and safety um, standpoint. And so properly sizing them um, could uh, increase uh, the tax revenues um, related to them to help compensate um, for the lower rates. And uh, <laughs> talking earlier with Michelle, uh, I'm sure you've talked with their MLAs uh, very often and so maybe this, this advice is a little bit more for landowners than municipalities, but um, together with collaborating um, with each other, um, talking with the MLAs and trying to push these issues and trying to, <clears throat> we don't necessarily have to have the solutions, but we need to start asking tough questions of our political leaders because this is an issue that has been under the rug for a long time. It's grown much too big to ignore. Um, maybe unfortunate, but we need to face it uh, head on. Um, if we're going to um, make sure that the polluter pays as much as possible because to any extent that we're not able to do that, it's going to fall to the taxpayers and municipalities and landowners are going to suffer the, the consequences of this aging infrastructure. And so um, maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll leave it there 
and I was really hoping to engage in a conversation, uh, hear about some more specific concerns or questions, and uh, hopefully Brad, I, and, and Michelle can answer uh, any questions that might have uh, come up until now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Reagan. Um, so I want to just take a minute to again thank Leanne and Nancy and Barry for supporting us and hosting the webinar today. Um, the information, as you can see, that these fellows have been able to um, gather is astronomical. And I think that um, together we can really leverage this to help ourselves and help our communities, our landowners, etc. So I think if we could just, um, if I could pass it over to Nancy, and if there are any questions, we could just jump into that. Well, I'm not seeing any questions um, coming through the chat, but I would invite people, all of the contact information of our speakers will be available on our website. So if you have anything specific, I would suggest that you reach out to them directly and uh, I'm sure they would be happy to engage with you. I know too, um, as I'm listening, I'm thinking very uh, AUMA and uh, some of the work that you guys are doing, this is such a natural fit too. I think we've got Gerald Rhodes on the call too, I saw from uh, rural municipalities of Alberta. Uh, I, I personally found you know, the data that you shared, um, Brad, uh, quite fascinating uh, when you think you can pull all that data together and get some, some uh, valid numbers. I think it's, it's quite interesting. Michelle, from an economic development standpoint, I'm just curious, um, you know, uh, your, your take on, on how this has impacted your role and uh, what you need to do. Um, so from an economic development perspective, as you know, um, we work to grow our communities, whether it be through industrial, commercial, residential development, um, tourism, et cetera. So this piece of land in particular, for Kalmar um, is situated right at the east edge of our, pro of our town where services are run. So um, logically, this would be the next parcel to develop. Um, and as I indicated, it is um, highly visible highway commercial and it is very well sought after industrial land because of the rail access. So, from an economic development perspective, like I'm unable to help my community to grow and attract that business that we so desperately need and increase our tax base um, outside of the residential piece. So as I indicated earlier, I do get inquiries on this piece of property at least once a week. And I spend hours talking about what I know and what I don't know. And <laughs> Um, again, like I said, it wasn't until I met Regan and the team that I learned that there's a lot that I don't know. And um, I can't, I, there's really, it's beyond me now. I can't do anything um, to help to sell the property because we don't know the state of the three well sites. So from an economic development perspective, this is a, a really big um, thorn in our side, <laughs> essentially. Um, because it's the next option to grow our community and I just I can't get there. So it's been a challenge. We do have one question that came in. Um, what can, hold on, let me just get to the chat box here. What can municipalities do to expedite the process of distributing the funds that have been provided by the federal uh, to our provincial governments? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. There is a billion dollars that's going to be distributed um, over the next two years, um, but there's no simple answer to that. Um, the money came fast. The program came fast. Um, it's going to come in ten pieces of ten hundred million dollar pieces. We only know the details of the first two pieces. So there's eight phases and eight hundred million dollars still to come for which the terms, the conditions, the focuses, the priorities are still all up in the air. And there's no reason that municipalities and the sort of challenges that Michelle faces 
couldn't be the focus of one of those following phases. And so um, these first two phases don't involve municipalities directly, um, but the next eight could. And so it's an open question and it's yet to be shaped that the province hasn't yet determined the, the details of how that's going to work. And so it's going to be up to stakeholders like the municipalities to um, make the case um, to be the focus of some of that foregoing money. Um, and so there is a, there is a, there's a process where you can nominate a well as a priority, um, but it doesn't get you very far. You're going to have to talk to provincial officials and try to influence um, this. Uh, the policies are, are not yet determined, so it's uh, still an open question, but the, there's no reason uh, part of it couldn't come your guys' direction. How about the idea of repurposing inactive wells and the possible economic benefits hydrogen, geothermal, lithium, so on. Um, have you thought about factoring those possibilities in? That was a question that came in. Yeah, we have done some work. There are There is a bunch of interesting work going in Southern Alberta with uh, some friends that work on similar things. Uh, solar in Southern Alberta makes a lot of sense on these rural sites. They're already connected to the power grid. And so there are a lot of um, circumstances where that makes sense. And so anything that can add value to these sites and generate some sort of income is a good idea. Um, but at the end of the day, um, is, those sort of opportunities should be pursued wherever they make sense. Uh, but we're still talking about a very small fraction of the overall problem. The number of sites, we've done some initial work with ALSIS looking at the, the solar potential of where these oil and gas sites are. And there's a limited amount that have the right conditions. Um, same thing with geothermal. Um, so they make sense, but it's only in a small number of cases. It, it doesn't substitute for an, an overall solution to tackle this problem. Harry, what do you think from AUMA's role? So uh, first of all, the, the data is fascinating. And, and I think, uh, I was, uh, Regan, it was interesting to hear you talk about a focus and what those focuses should be. And, and when you do couple it with, with uh, Michelle's problem, and obviously, Michelle, you know, it's not just your municipality's problem. It's several municipalities in Alberta that have undeveloped property uh, with well site cleanup that needs to happen. And, and that could open, uh, you know, a cascade effect of economic development in those communities. So I think there's a good case to be made. So I will certainly be going back to my board of directors and, um, you know, a big learning for me, I didn't realize this level of data was available, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And uh, so congratulations to, uh, to you guys for doing that. But I'll be taking to this my to this uh, to my board and saying, hey, you know, in the case of Calmar, and like I said, there are several other communities in very similar situations uh, in our in our membership uh, that certainly could benefit from a focused area, and make the case that the economic uh, benefit would be multiplied by by targeting cleanups in areas that uh, the extra activity could happen on. So that was pretty interesting. I do have a question for for Regan and Brad though. I'm just curious, you know, all this work you're doing, how, how do you, how are you supported? I'm, I'm curious about that uh, because uh, obviously um, not knowing about what you've done, but certainly very interested and can certainly see the value of it. I'm just curious how you guys are supported to, to, to do this work. Well, I've been um, working on these issues for the last four or five years. And in the last couple of years, I've gotten um, some funding from the Catherine Donnelly Foundation um, here in Canada, a Catholic charity. Um, this helped supported the work and that's how I was able to do this data work. I got this enormous amount of data from the regulator and I spent my last year's funding almost entirely on the programming to finish this work and to help even contribute to the cost that Brad and Alsis have put in to uh, mapping all of this stuff. And so it's a couple of foundation um, grants over the last couple of years. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not normal. I, I'm a roofer. I work construction full time. I do this in my spare time for fun. I put thousands of hours into this unpaid. <clears throat> this is what I do, whether I'm getting paid or not. Um, but it's uh, a couple of those. Uh, and so Reclaim Alberta is the organization along with ALDP, all of our funders, anyone we've gotten money from is all up there. Um, and, but it's <clears throat> the vast majority of this has been voluntary contributions um, from experts uh, concerned about this issue, willing to contribute uh, and just uh, chipping in on that basis. We've accomplished most of this and um, trying to turn it. There's, there's so much work to be done. 
um, we're trying to find the partners so we can do more of this work. Uh, but so far it's been uh, passion and volunteering in, in the largest parts. Yeah, Brad hey, here, Brad. I just maybe add that um, once we, once the Elsie's group understood the magnitude of the problem from, from Regan, um, my group agreed that we would start trying to tackle this in terms of technology that could help support him and, and, and various stakeholder groups like land owners and municipalities. Um, so Regan was able to find some funds that, that covered off the data importing. And then we got um, busy basically building an online uh, database and simulator kind of scaled at municipalities to provide a technology that they could individually use look at their issue and, and try to optimize this. And we've got part way down that road, um, put in a lot of charity work, um, but we certainly appreciated the funds that Regan did bring in. And then we got as far as we could about the time of COVID affected our group. And, and uh, so we've got, a, we've got a, a product that we think is, is helpful and we've got some additional work. We'd, we'd like to see it kind of subscribed out to municipalities where they can cost effectively use it to, to address this issue. So. And, uh if I can, is that uh, I'm on the board of a small charity um, called the Transformation Research Network that was able to, uh, uh, through Reagan and, uh, and David Swan and others, get access to a foundation grant for the last little while, a Canadian foundation, not an American foundation, uh, to do this, to do the work that is around uh, responding to COVID, putting this kind of material together, trying to get this on a practical basis that can be communicated out to municipalities and landowners to see exactly what you can do, things like this. Plus uh, the, the, uh, the dealings around Bill 12 and the changes to the orphan well situation and the issue with the federal government coming, putting money into it. So it's Canadian taxpayers are paying for this now as well as Alberta taxpayers. And that that's grant has just been finally uh, finished and reported off, but that's how it's been done for the last little while. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I, I just, in the interest of time, I just uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for approaching us and uh, bringing, you know, the work that Reagan and Brad are doing to the forefront. And Barry, uh, thank you for joining us in, in co-hosting this, this webinar. I think it's fascinating work. And I know that the work AUMA, I know this is a, this would be a great uh, opportunity for you guys to get more information as well. On, on this and the challenges that municipalities are facing and, and economic developers are you know, trying to deal with, but very limited uh, ability to do so. So uh, once again, thank you for taking the time. I apologize for my internet crapping out early on <laughs> as I was talking, but Barry, thank you for stepping in. Um, and uh, for those of you who want to, uh, within the next day, we will have this, this tape uh, if you want to share it with any of your colleagues. I know it will also have information on how to get in touch with uh, Regan and Brad and, and Michelle. And uh, once again, thank you for taking the time and uh, have a great day.